Hello and welcome to our Bible study for May 15th, 2022. Uh, we're starting a new series for the summer uh, and we're looking at questions that define different centuries as kind of a way to give an overview of uh, church history. And our, to, we're starting off today, of course, with question divide, define the first century. Uh, and the big question there is what was the relationship between Judaism and Christianity? Uh, and an account from the beginning of Jesus' ministry uh, kind of shows us that tension uh, pretty early on. Uh, it's from Luke chapter 4, so this is right after uh, Jesus' baptism and Jesus' temptation uh, when Jesus begins his ministry. And he says, And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And Jesus said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum do not hear, do here in your hometown as well. He said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. And so uh, here again we get this, uh, see this tension between um, Judaism and Christianity uh, right from the, from the very beginning. Uh, and we see here that Jesus is... Um, is starting from a, a Jewish foundation that he's in the synagogue. We're told it's his custom. You know, we saw, we see from the beginning of Luke that uh, Jesus is brought up by his parents and they go to the temple annually for the sacrifices. And, you know, they, they keep the rituals. They're, they're, they're good Jews. They follow, follow all those rites and rituals and things. Um, but then, and here Jesus is, he's in synagogue like usual. He reads from the, from Isaiah, one of the prophets, it's just the interpretation of that and then what it means afterwards is where, th where things get, get the tension. Um, and he also um, points out that thread throughout Scripture, that throughout, throughout the Old Testament, that while God had chosen the people of Israel um, to be his chosen people, um, that they weren't chosen just for themselves, but they were chosen so that the whole world could be blessed through them. Uh, we see that all the way back when Abraham is called by God and that uh, that the whole world will be blessed through him. Uh, that's why Jesus is able to mention the widow of Zarephath, the name of the Syrian, as uh, people outside Judaism, people who aren't Jewish, who aren't Israelite, who are become God followers. And so are and are and are watched over by God and cared for by God, um, and so that's going to be the t tension as we go. And so of course it starts out. Of course we see that here in the here in the Gospels a few times, and kind of so the the summary overview here reminding us is again Jesus and his disciples are Jewish, and start from that foundation, but they move in different directions than Judaism, and that causes conflict. So that they keep keep expanding or moving on Judaism beyond what things like this. You know Isaiah prophecy. You know we, you know Christian, we Christians will see this as obviously it's a messianic prophecy, and all obviously it's talking about Jesus. Um, but the Jews, uh, Jews would say, well, it's it might be a prophecy about a Messiah, but it's not about not pointing to Jesus. All right, and then uh, there Jesus came to fulfill the mission for which Israel had always existed, but had not always recognized to be the collective channel of God's salvation to the entire world. 
All right, um, but we see this tension, you know, elsewhere. Um, that first off, and when when Jesus sends out his disciples, sends out the twelve, he tells them, "Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel." And so he's starting it as a very his his following is focusing it on on the Jews, uh, but we'll see it expands. Um, that's part of what creates tension. And Jesus also says that. You know, he he doesn't see him himself as stepping outside of this tradition. He's see, kind of fulfilling the tradition. He says, the beginning of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, right after the Beatitudes, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so Jesus comes not to abolish the law, not to just get rid of, throw everything out, uh, but instead fulfill them. All the prophecies point to him. Um, and that every, everything else points to him. And so um, we'll see that kind of affects Christianity as we, as, as we go on. Um, things like all the sacrifices in the temple to take away the sin. Well, that all pre, you know, uh, foreshadows or we'll talk, you know, fancy theological way to talk about it is, is typology, that it's a type, that it, it points to it's those look ahead to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross but now that that's ha- now that Jesus died on the cross, we don't need those other sacrifices anymore, and that's going to be a, a point of tension too. Uh, we also see the conflict coming from the other side. Uh, Jesus heals a blind man. Uh, the Pharisees try and discredit the miracle. Um, so first they talk to the blind man, uh, and then they talk to the blind man's parents because they want to figure out well maybe this guy was faking it, and that's how the how the miracle worked. Um, but the parents don't really side with their with their son, they say, "Well, yes, he's been he's been blind, but we don't know why how he got healed." Um, and so they they're they're afraid to stand up for their son because, uh, well, as John tells us in a parenthetical comment here, the blind man's parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. And so we've already got that tension going on that uh, that if if you think Jesus is the Christ, then you're not a good a good Jew, so you need to be taken out of the synagogue. Uh, so we see that tension present in the Gospels, uh, but then we see this really kind of come to play, come come into play uh, in Acts in the in the early time of the church, at, and that's when uh, Judaism and Christianity really start to diverge from one another, um, because the they start with Jewish converts to Christianity, uh, but then they start getting Gentile converts too, and that creates a whole mess of other issues. Um, on on in all three sides. Um, so of course Peter has his vision, um, and is and says that eventually sh- figures out that God shows no partiality. And we'll actually see that if you um, in in the reading from Acts for for today. So if you're in uh, in church uh, uh, this Sunday, or if you you watch our service online, uh, our first reading uh, the reading from Acts is from Acts chapter eleven. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second, a voice answered from a second time from heaven, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and said, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? 
When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. And so, and here we get this, this tension coming be, between um, not only do you have the, the, the Jews who remain Jews in religion, uh, but you have the uh, Jewish Christians who are trying to figure out, well, what, is it, what does this mean for us as if we're Christian and Jesus has fulfilled the law? How does that work? And then you've got now these Gentile Christians coming in into the fold in, in larger numbers. Uh, and so what do they have to do to be, be Christian? That will be a so big source of tension. I mean, and it's a source of tension, of course, for, for the disciples too. I mean, it takes Peter this huge vision you know, God has to tell him, you, well, first talking about foods, but then it, it, you know, it immediately applies to uh, reaching out to Gentiles as well. Just this whole, you know, if you've been taught for 30 years that, well, you're, you're going to be unclean if you go into a place where these people are, so don't go there. And then suddenly you're told, well, no, you need to go there. Um, that's a huge mindset. Or, um, you know, again, the focus in on these, the dietary laws, which, um, you know, we as Christians can joke about, would, would, would be, but it would have been a huge deal um, that, um, you know, you can't eat, can't eat pork, can't eat shellfish, can't eat um, milk and meat mixed together. Um, those kinds, of, the, the, you know, I mean, just all those kinds of things. Um, and then to suddenly be able to eat that. Uh, would have been, you know, your body's not used to it and you're not used to, you're just, you think, no, this doesn't work. Um, you know, that would have been a huge mindset change too. Um, and so different people uh, struggle with it because, of course, it's one thing if you, for the people who are on the front lines of mission work to be doing this. And it's a whole other, other thing for um, people who are just back in Jerusalem still living among them in a Jewish majority culture um, of dealing with figuring out how to handle that. So... Um, we see this then, of course, uh, we see this, of course, happen, this is what happens with Peter, of course, happens more with Paul. Um, so Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. Uh, John, that's John Mark, uh, left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went down into the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. And so Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you hear for, hear for your God, listen. And so, again, they're going out explicitly as Christian missionaries by this point, because it's after Paul's seen the angel on the road to Damascus. And yet, um, they're still being, being invited into the synagogue to share words of encouragement. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll skip Paul's sermon. You can go back and read it on your own. Um, but again, to start talk, starting with, with what they were familiar with and building up to Jesus. Um, and so when, they, when he finishes, then he then, uh, so they went out. The people begged that they might, these things might be told on the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So not only does he give a sermon in the synagogue, but it's well received by a lot of people, both those who are Jewish and those who've converted to Judaism. That's the uh, devout converts. Uh, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading through the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirring up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. And so again, we see this break starting to happen more and more explicitly. And then, of course, the big thing that defines this is uh, the so-called Jerusalem Council uh, takes place in 49 or 50 AD, so not quite 20, 15, 20 years after uh, after the crucifixion of Jesus, which was 30 to 33 A.D., um, and so here, here, well, here this sets up, but it's that 
tension between Jews, Jewish, Jewish Christians, and Gentile Christians and how they all relate. Um, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, this sounds like a un huge understatement, um, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders and declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And so you see here, actually, you know, part of that tension, you've got some people who were Pharisees who become Christians, but who are still kind of clinging to some of those, those ideas. Uh, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul, and they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they had finished speaking, James, this is James, brother of Jesus, who's kind of head of the church in Jerusalem, replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, Simon Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. And that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And so, and so the Jerusalem Council then kind of resolves itself. Um, again, you get Peter. Peter speaks first, uh, then James speaks last. Um, and James as um, probably the most, I know, hard to put him on a conservative liberal scale, but um, James would be the one least least likely to change. Again, he's he's in Jerusalem, and so he's dealing with this tension most acutely on the Jewish side. And so he, his his action is well, no, we can't make the Gentiles don't have to become Jews before they become Christians. They just have to become Christians. But we're going to f do this with the same way that um, and we find this in Leviticus uh, that. Uh, Gentile converts to Judaism and, and Gentiles who were living in, in Israel, um, you know, in the time of the Old Testament, um, they just had to do those four things, um, avoid things polluted by idols from sexual immorality, what's been strangled and from blood. So you can eat, eat th food, you can eat food that's used to be declared unclean, but how it's killed is more important than what it is. Um, and then still, of course, avoid sexual immorality and avoid things sacrificed to idols. And of course, we know from uh, for, from Paul's letter to the Corinthians that that's a that's an issue. Um, but yeah, and so that's how the council kind of ends itself, and then um, it continues on and reminds us then that it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. 
For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. You abstain from what's been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what's been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Uh, then we see, of course, this tension that keeps happening. Um, somewhat unclear exactly when, Galatia, when Paul writes Galatians compared to the uh, this Jerusalem council, but it's kind of on the same same idea. And Paul, of course, is very much on the uh, Gentiles just become Christians, don't need to follow Jewish laws anymore. Um, and that, he, that the distinctions are gone uh, between, that are, there's just Christians, there's not Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians anymore. Uh, which, but the problem is, of course, focusing on that means then separates Christians further and further from, from Jews. Or later in Galatians 5, he writes, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And so again, his idea is that going back and following the Jewish laws is adding on to what Jesus has said. It's creating burdens. And so... Um, needs to be avoided. And Paul, of course, uh, ten, feels very strongly about this and uses pretty heated language to describe this. All right. Um, and then Paul also, I mean, of course, uh, in then writing to the Philippians, uh, which is one of his last letters, Galatians, towards one of his earlier letters, um, he writes about how, you know, if, if you were comparing your resume of, Judaism, of Jewishness, Paul would win, but he doesn't think it matters anymore. That for though, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And that he sees that as the key. That faith is the key and not this other thing. And so, again, this is creating then more and more um, separation um, between the Jews and the, and the Christians. Um, and this ends up playing um, playing a big part as well, um, because while Judaism had had was recognized as a religion under the Roman Empire, and if it, when as long as Christianity was just a subset of Judaism, just a sect of Judaism, then it looked that way too. Um, but once it becomes a separate thing, um, then that creates other issues from in from the Romans in terms of how they deal with Christians and some of the persecutions of rise. Although, of course, this, by the end, then, even Judaism isn't necessarily seen as, um, as a good thing in, uh, for the Romans. Because, um, if you remember, we've talked about this a few times as we were looking at the witnesses to Christ and, and the zealots and the priests and what happens afterwards. But So the destruction of the temple in 70 AD when the Romans conquered Jerusalem is often seen as the final breaking point between Judaism and Christianity because both of them have to change so much. So uh, this is part of the Arch of Titus in Rome. And you can see, you know, the um, they had depictions of people carrying away the loot uh, we can see here the menorah. So this is taking the stuff from the temple. The temple's destroyed. And so that means also Judaism has to change because, again, if you're focused in on all this, on the sacrifices that are happening, happening at the temple as a big part of, your, of what's going on, and now there's no temple, there's no sacrifices there. Um, and in fact, it'll, it'll ta it takes, takes a few more years. Uh, I think it's 130 is when even Jews are kicked, totally kicked out of Jerusalem that 
um, you know, their religion has to change too and becomes much more um, cerebral, much more focused on on the on the on the readings. Uh, you know, less focused or more focused on the rituals that you do either as a family or, or in the synagogue and, you know, looking ahead to the uh, when the temple stuff might be restored. Um, and so that creates a big, big point of divergence then, too, because Judaism just change, it has to change so much after the temple's destroyed that the two groups keep going further and further away. Uh, and it doesn't help um, that... So the Jews are dealing with all this grief over what's happened to Jerusalem, and then early Christian writers thought the destruction of the temple confirmed prophecies of Christ and showed God's patience with the Jews finally ran out. So again, Jesus talks warns about against the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and so that's part of why um, there's accounts that all the Jewish Christians, once they figured out what was going on, that the Romans were coming, they all went off to, to the, um, the city of Petra, um, and and we're able to stay safe there um, because they listened to Jesus and and remembered his warnings against the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, but you had, of course, if the you point at the Jews and say, well, that, this is all the Jerusalem got destroyed because you didn't believe Jesus. They're um, dealing with their grief. They're not going to react well necessarily to that. Um, and then the the Didache, uh, it's a second century writing about uh, how to be a disciple, kind of teaching. Um, urge Christians to fast on different days than Jews to demonstrate more of the separation between the two groups. Um, you know, we see that that happens sometimes as well. You know, part of why well Jew, Jews worship on the Sabbath is Saturday. Well, we we our Sabbath is Sunday. Um, you know, we make sure that we can eat pork. Um, you know, I mean, so, uh, some of those things, and we, and we find that with other things things too. Uh, you know, we're too. Lutherans are sometimes criticized as being too Catholic, so we avoid some of those things that you know we could do, but don't want to do because it's uh, be seen as too Catholic. On the other hand, sometimes we're seen as too evangelical, and so try and avoid those things um, going on. And then uh, historian um, Yaroslav Pelikan, uh, he was started out as a Lutheran, taught at the seminary in St. Louis, uh, but then ended up uh, becoming Orthodox later in life. Um, but he said that virtually every major Christian writer of the first five centuries either composed a treatise in opposition to Judaism or made this issue a dominant theme in a treatise devoted to some other subject. And so there's a lot of tension, you know, that no, we're not Jewish anymore. A lot of that going on, um, you know, polemically in, in the writing um, or in the, over this first century, first century as well. Um, so again, so how do we understand uh, final questions for reflection and thought. So how do we understand Judaism today? Uh, again, remembering that Judaism changed with the destruction of the temple, that um, Judaism today looks, you know, doesn't necessarily look a whole lot like what Judaism looked like in Jesus' day, just, you know, again, two centuries, just like, you know, in some some ways, um, you know, Peter and Paul would be able to recognize our, our Christian worship or the Christian worship of any of the other uh, churches in town, but in some ways it would be very different, very weird. Um, but we also then see it as a different uh, religion, the kind of that final reflection then, uh, what's the relationship between Christianity and Judaism today? Um, and again, friendly, I mean, we can, you know, work together on, on some on social things, but recognizing that um, because they don't don't believe in Jesus as their Messiah, that uh, that's a source of, of tension. And, and so as Christians, we think they've, they've missed the point of the Bible. Um, but uh, one way to kind of think then, though, of um, just get in that mindset of that, you know, that uh, for, for, for Jewish people the, in the way that Christians talk about them sometimes uh, would be the same way that either Muslims or Mormons talk about uh, normal Christians. Um, that uh, both of both of them claim that they're both those groups claim they've got another book after that happens after what we have. So just like you know, we have the New Testament comes after the Jewish scriptures that we call the Old Testament. So the um, uh, the the Quran, the 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 Islamic holy book, and the Book of Mormon, and and the other writings there both claim to be after coming after the Bible and help us help reinterpret it. 
Um, and so the way that the Muslims are, you know, say, well, you're yeah, Christians, you got some of it, but you you miss the whole point that Jesus was really pointing you to Allah. He wasn't God himself, uh, or that Jesus wasn't telling you that you were you're saved, but he then he's telling you how you can become like God. Uh, oversimplified bit of the Mormon part, um, but just kind of recognizing that 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 feeling uh, of you know, that, well, our our group supersedes your group and your group is is wrong. Um, that when we talk about Jews like that, that that just isn't uh, always received received well. Um, and so part of that tension too. But thank you for uh, joining us. Obviously it's uh, hard to cover this whole topic in uh, about a half hour, um, but uh, we'll look forward to continuing to go through the centuries with you um, this summer. Thank you.